So I, I'm, I'm delighted to be here this morning, and, and I really applaud you for getting up on a Saturday and coming in. Um, I, I think one of the best things you can do for yourselves is to get information, and so that's a good sign that you're doing it. So we don't want to scare you with gory pictures, um, but we do want to give you some, some knowledge. Um, so I actually am doing a departure from what I usually talk about because I think one of the really important things in the field is all of the new drugs we have, and we're all excited about it, and you're going to hear that in all the talks today, really emerged out of clinical trials. And if you are dealing with melanoma, at some point you may actually hear the word clinical trial. Your doctor may ask you about whether you might want to consider that. And what I find is a lot of patients have no idea what that really is. And so it leads to a lot of questions. You know, are you being a guinea pig? Is there really any benefit from it? Um, is there danger in doing this? And if I do it, how do I pick what trial to do? And, and where do I go for this? And so I really wanted to focus my talk on, is a clinical trial right? you know, for you in, in your individual situation. So we're going to talk a little bit about how, how this evolved, and I'll spend a little time telling you about why we're so excited today about um, melanoma. So first of all, cancer, we all know, is a really terrible disease. And in 1973, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Law in, uh, Act into law, and really established the National Cancer Institute and began what was called the War on Cancer. And back in the 1960s and the early 1970s, we were really thinking that cancer was a single disease. And so the approach to it was really trying to do the same thing for all types of cancer. And I think the research that was done in the early days of the National Cancer Institute really led to a very important and simple conclusion that all cancers are actually not the same. In fact, they can be really different. And today, this morning, we're talking about melanoma, and we, we're not talking about breast cancer because it's a totally different talk. And the causes of the diseases are different, their behavior is different, and in many cases, the treatments are different. So I think by the year 2000, we really had a good idea that the way to attack these is to really individualize it and to really develop some specialization and get some really smart minds, like you're going to hear about today, to focus on the, the melanoma problem. And in 1996, a very important thing happened, and that was the human genome got sequenced. And that was a really big event. I don't know if you remember, there was a big uh, reception in the White House. It was, it was on CNN. And, and the question became, well, what does that actually mean? And actually what it means is that we knew all of the DNA inside of a cell in humans. And this was a very important advance. And enormous discoveries have happened since then and has really allowed us not only to look at cancers across a wide range of types, but to actually start looking very individually in a given patient. Sometimes even if a, a, tumor, a melanoma spreads, we can take two different melanomas out and they can have two different kind of DNA profiles, if you will. And so this has led to the concept that we call today precision medicine. And this is, um, you know, means different things to different people, but it means precisely understanding not just about cancer and not just about melanoma, but about what's going on in the melanoma in the, in the specific patient that, that has the disease. And we know that that may even change over time in that patient, and we have to constantly be looking at that. So why this is important is it's led to what I think are two major breakthroughs um, that I think in history will, will be looked at as um, major advances in the medical field. And excitingly, both of these happened in melanoma. And we are beginning to see the impact of that in, in the clinic. So one of those is really understanding what the genetic problems are that make melanoma cells different from normal cells. And so... A lot of work has been done understanding how the genes are actually making abnormal proteins, which are making these cells divide and grow and spread. And so this is a cartoon, and this is really representing the cell surface. And so the first gene I want to mention is this one up here. This actually is a gene called KIT or CKIT, and it is a um, kind of 
a, gr a growth factor receptor. So when it gets a signal to grow and to divide, it gives the signal to the cell that it's time to proliferate. And sometimes that's a good thing because we want the cells to divide, and in cancer we don't want them to divide. So why do they divide? Well, in a very small number of melanomas, this particular receptor has a mutation in it, meaning it's not normal, and it just keeps on signaling even though there's no growth signals for it. And so it gives the cell a very bad, a bad message to keep on dividing when it shouldn't be. And even though this is not common in melanoma, probably about 6-7% of melanomas may have mutations in this gene, the exciting thing is that there are a number of drugs now that can actually identify this mutation and actually stop it. And so the, the first drug was a drug called imatinib or Gleevec, and actually that was approved by the FDA for treating a rare form of leukemia and a rare form of sarcoma, and is now actually in clinical trials. In fact, our guest speaker today, I think, contributed to some of these studies. And there are a number of other agents now that target the C-kit that were in, in the process of testing in clinical studies for melanoma. So the way the kit works is it activates a number of proteins within the cell, which continue this giving these abnormal signals to, to, to the melanoma cell. So one of those is called BRAF. And this one you might be familiar with because we actually test patients now pretty regularly to see if they have a mutation in BRAF. It's an important one, again, because it's quite common. So about 50% of all, at least, skin melanomas will have a mutation in the BRAF. And again, there are some drugs that seem to be very effective at blocking this and can stop the cells from dividing. So two of them, one called vemurafenib or, or zelboraf, was approved by the FDA in, in 2011 to treat melanoma. And dibrafenib is another one that, that has now been FDA approved that also targets BRAF. And as exciting as this is, and sometimes these drugs work very quickly, they sometimes will stop working. And the reason, at least in some cases, is that the BRAF actually signals to other proteins. Um, so the next one in the chain is one called MEK, M-E-K. And so if the BRAF is, is fine, sometimes the MEK becomes abnormal in these cells, and that allows the cell to keep on going. So what if you block that one? So there is actually now a drug called trametinib that was also approved in combination with the brafenib, or is used in combination with the brafenib, um, to treat melanoma. And so we're very excited about these new drugs coming up and combining them together to see if they might be more effective. And one of the reasons that this may not be the whole story is that there are other pathways. So this PI3K and AKT and mTOR are other proteins that have the cell signal. And again, there are drugs in development towards all of these. There are, are um, drugs currently being um, developed by companies to target all of these, and we're quite excited about looking at these and in combination. And I think this has really changed the landscape for, for many patients. The other breakthrough, of course, is one that, that um, um, I, uh, is, is near to me because I've been working on it for a long time, and that is the use of the immune system. And so last year in 2013, um, this was made to, uh, we, we made the public think this was an overnight success story when, in fact, um, understanding how the immune system can help us fight cancer has really been an idea that's been around for over 100 years. And so um, the, the thing that has changed is that I think we understand some of the cells involved, we understand how this works a little better, and we have much better drugs available. And we'll tell you about some of them because we actually are testing some of them in clinical trials actually right here in this building. Um, and so this has uh, been particularly exciting because when immunotherapy works, sometimes we get very durable responses. And in fact, some of my melanoma patients that I treated, you know, 15 years ago are still alive today, even when they had very advanced disease that had, had spread. Um, and so when this works, it works really well. And a lot of us have an interest in this, and understanding why it works so well in some patients and maybe not in others it will allow us to expand the number of patients who might benefit from this treatment. So all of these new things really first started in clinical trials. And it seems like this may be a really simple question to ask, what is a clinical trial? But it actually turns out not to be that simple to answer. So there are a lot of type of clinical studies. Um, so there are people that collect just information, registry kind of studies, just to kind of learn about trends that are going on. There are studies that are designed to evaluate new diagnostic tests. There are studies that look at 
patient behaviors, um, and there are studies that really look at treatments and its impact on uh, prevention or treatment of a disease. And at least for today, I'm going to focus all of my talk really on what we would call interventional clinical trials. These are treatments or procedures that are really designed to either prevent or treat melanoma. In general, this is how we as scientists really determine if a treatment or a combination of, of treatments actually has an impact on a disease. It also helps us to really identify how much drug to give, um, when to give it, and what the side effects are for a drug. Um, we absolutely do a lot of animal testing. That's usually the first step. And animal testing really gives us some really important clues. It will tell us if sometimes if drugs are effective, it might give us some insight into how they're working. It sometimes gives us clues to what we should be watching for in patients. But we know that mice are not humans. And even when we study drugs in primates, sometimes the, it could be very different in a human. Um, we're all different. And I think until we actually test some of these things in actual patients, we often don't know whether they're going to work or they're not going to work. So it is very important to understand that. Second point I'd make about clinical trials is these are essentially experiments. Um, these are uh, there are no guarantees with the clinical trial. Um, there's absolutely no certainty that it will work. Um, there's no certainty that it won't work. Um, usually, uh, these things, any drug or any procedure that's in a clinical trial undergoes enormous scrutiny. And my colleagues will tell you that we sit on all kinds of committees to review these, and so nothing goes into patients, or at least it shouldn't be going into patients, until there's enormous amounts of review and this, uh, particularly in the big academic centers, is occurring at a federal level. Um, it's often occurring in the private sector and industry, and then it's also occurring at local institutions, universities, and hospitals, and even sometimes in doctor's offices. Um, there is data to suggest that cancer patients in particular do often get a real benefit. Um, that benefit sometimes may be a little one. Um, it may be a little bit of an improvement in response. Sometimes there's a real breakthrough. Um, and I think that I was uh, actually just on a panel that reviews um, recombinant DNA for patients who go on to clinical studies down in Washington at, at the uh, National Institutes of Health. And we got into a big discussion about the potential benefits uh, versus not benefits for patients. And at least in, in, can, in the cancer world, it does appear that there have been real benefits. And some of my colleagues made the point, which I think is a good one, that today more than ever, we have some really interesting things. And again, as my, my colleagues will probably tell you, we just don't have enough time in the day to test everything that we would probably want to test that we think is, is very interesting. Or we've seen some animal work. I know Dr. Goidos actually does work in his lab and puts some of these things into the mice. And then he calls me up and says, you Never guess what I just saw. This looks great. We, we've got to test this in a patient now. Um, and so, um, you know, there's a very long process to make that happen, but there's a lot of good things going on right now. The one point I would make, too, and a lot of my patients tell me this, is even if you may not benefit from a clinical trial, almost certainly other patients will benefit. And understanding what doesn't work is almost as important as understanding what does work. And um, I think, again, um, for the most part, when you go on a clinical study, you get a lot of attention from everybody. And I think that, that ultimately, we, we do take very good care of patients in, in these studies. Now, the goal of clinical trials, again, as I said, is, is a multitude of, of things. So one is we're looking to see you know, how much of a drug and when we should give it. We're, we're looking to see what the side effects are. We're looking to see if it works. And sometimes we talk about phases. And I can, I, this is a very confusing concept to patients. So, um, and I've heard patients say, well, I'll never go on a phase one study, or I, I have to be in a phase three study. Um, but, do you, but do you really know what that actually means? So uh, like I said, we have a, a very rigorous process in this country for testing cancer drugs. So I can't just decide that Dr. Goidos's drug looks good, and I'm going to go give it to my patient tomorrow morning. Um, so often the testing begins in animals, and sometimes we'll do what's called a phase zero. So this really refers to, before we even get to a human patient, we're actually going to look at some of the effects of this. So for example, 
um, if we had a new BRAF inhibitor that we thought would be good in melanoma, we actually know that BRAF actually operates in other cells besides melanoma cells. So BRAF is in, for example, lymphocytes or, or T cells, part of the white blood cells. So we might collect blood from a normal person, we might collect blood from a patient, and we might look to see how that drug is affecting those T cells in the laboratory before we want to put it into patients just to make sure that it's not going to do something bad to those cells, and that would be called a phase zero. Um, we don't always do phase zeros, but when there's some suggestion that we might need some additional testing outside of the animals before we go to humans, then we would do that. A phase one usually refers to the first time a drug is being tested in, a, in, a, in an actual patient. And the goal of phase one studies is changing a little bit because we have, as I mentioned, a lot of good agents. And so um, I do think that we've wanted to speed the process up a little bit. Um, but in general, phase ones are designed to really understand how safe is the drug, what are the side effects. Now again, this is, we're, not, we're not doing this blindly because we often have a lot of data from animals and the FDA has to approve everything before we can even do a phase one. And they will ask us, and they've asked me many times, well, show us all the animal data. And if we haven't checked the blood counts and the chemistries and the electrolytes, then they often make us go back and do that. So we'll have a, some clues as to how a drug might actually impact patients. But until we actually put it into people, we don't know. Another major goal of a phase one is to really determine the maximum dose that we can give. So some phase one studies will actually have different doses. And typically, we start with a low dose, and then we increase it as long as it's safe and it hasn't caused too many side effects. And in general, in a phase one study, we follow patients pretty carefully. So there's a lot of blood work. We get EKGs. We get urine tests. We really want to know what this drug is doing to patients. Sometimes if a drug we think is going to be safe, we'll actually go in the opposite direction and start at a high dose. And if that looks good, then start taking the dose down um, if there are side effects. And that's a little trick that our, our statistician friends have taught us to kind of speed up the process if something is very promising. Because um, sometimes we, we, we are very interested in a particular drug, you'll see a combined thing like a phase one and two study. Um, but when I was starting my career, most phase one studies were often, you know, 10 or 12 patients, maybe 18 patients. Today, a lot of these phase one studies are 100 patients. Um, and that's because we're uh, very excited about particular drugs. Sometimes, uh, particularly in the immunotherapy field, um, what's very interesting is some drugs seem to be working in many different types of cancer. So rather than testing it in just one type of cancer, we're now being able to test it in multiple types of cancer. And they may be different, and it may work in one and not in the other. So that's why it's important to, to um, put in enough patients to make sure that we don't miss um, a potentially effective drug. A big advantage of phase one studies is that you do often get to get the drug very quickly, long before it's going to be approved. Um, and in typical in phase one studies is there are no placebos. Um, sometimes there are randomizations today, but, uh, you know, uh, typically a phase one is one drug. You're getting it. You know exactly what's going to happen. It's pretty straightforward. <laughs> Now, in phase two, is, is these are studies that are really designed to see if a drug is actually working against the tumor in some way. Some studies are looking, is the drug shrinking the tumor? Um, is the drug prolonging survival? Is the drug delaying the, the, the time that it takes for the tumor to progress? Um, and different phase twos have different what we would call endpoints. And again, these may be individualized to specific studies. Some phase two studies may just be giving patients drug to get a sense of how active it may be. Other phase twos may be what we call randomized, where half the patients or two-thirds of the patients will get the drug in question and the others will get something else. Sometimes that other thing is a standard approved agent and sometimes that thing could be a different drug. So uh, phase twos are, can be a little bit more complicated. And we generally enroll more patients in phase two. So usually these are studies that are geared toward about 50 to 100 or so patients. So it kind of depends what the ultimate goal of the study is. And the final step um, in clinical development is to go to what's called phase three. And phase three is really a study that is designed to absolutely prove that a drug is, in fact, better than whatever the current standard therapy is. 
And if we only had one standard of therapy, these would be easy studies maybe to design. But fortunately today, we may have many uh, different drugs. And so these, these uh, studies can be a little bit tricky to kind of design. Um, I would say that, that this is where placebos have generally been used in the phase three setting. Um, if there's no effective therapy, then you compare it to really no therapy, which would be a placebo. In the case that there is an effective therapy, it's very common to compare the new drug to whatever the FDA-approved drug is. And what we want to show is, in fact, the new drug is going to be a lot better. So again, when you go in phase three, you're coming into a drug that probably has already been tested in a large number of patients. We probably know exactly what dose to give and when to give it. We know a lot about the side effects of the drug, but the downside is that you may not actually get the drug. So that's something that you have to really ask questions about. And then I just mentioned phase four is, again, not very common. But if there are questions about a drug at the time that the FDA approves it, they sometimes will ask for additional testing of specific things. And um, that can be in, in a phase four setting. So for example, we recently, um, I, I participated in, in, a, in a phase four study of a drug that actually was FDA approved. And the company that was making it wanted to know whether it was better to give it as a capsule or as a pill. And so they did a phase four study to, to look at the difference between the two. OK. So what are the things that you need to keep in mind if your doctor says there's a clinical trial for you or if you're interested? So first of all, you can't just say yes. And unfortunately, I can't just say yes. And doc even Dr. Carvajal can't just say yes. You can go in. So there are what we call eligibility criteria. So you have to be eligible for the study. And again, a lot of my patients don't understand some of uh, the strange things with this, but this is really designed to protect patients. So we really want to make sure that if we're giving these drugs to patients, that there's not going to be a particular problem. So for example, if we know a drug might impact the heart in some way, we would actually put in as an eligibility to make sure that there's not any underlying problems with the heart. So if somebody's had a lot of uh, heart attacks, for example, this may not be a good drug to, for them to get because it could cause a heart attack. And even though it may be great for cancer, we obviously don't want patients to die of a heart attack while they're on this drug. So studies are typically designed for particular types of cancer or a stage of cancer. So again, we will typically begin most cancer testing in the most advanced stages of cancer, stage four. And if it looks good there and gets approved there, we'll often then bring it to the stage three, and we kind of work backwards in that way. We also sometimes have age restrictions on studies. This is more so for children, and because children are, in fact, different than adults, the drugs may work differently. They may have different side effects. And so some studies will not allow um, people, patients under the age of 18, and sometimes there are separate studies for that group um, that are done specifically to look at that. And uh, increasingly, we're changing the age limits. But again, there may be that. Um, some studies will put a cap age-wise. I think in the early days of immunotherapy, for example, there was concern that using immunotherapy in patients who were um, over 70 might be dangerous. Um, I think the data so far that's been coming out is suggesting that it may actually be quite safe in patients. And in fact, I just enrolled a 92-year-old patient on, on a clinical study actually um, a few weeks ago, and he's actually he's doing fine. Um, sometimes the location and the size of, the, of, of the, the cancer, it makes a big difference. So some studies require that the cancer has spread. Um, some studies require that the cancer has not spread. Um, Sometimes you have to have cancers that are at least a centimeter in size so that they can be better measured. So um, sometimes you'll have a patient who will have a, a melanoma and it's, it's like half a centimeter and then they're not going to be a candidate for us. It's too small. And part of that is that, you know, as Dr. Goitos will tell you, as surgeons, usually we can cut those out and we want to make sure that a patient who might be potentially cured by surgery doesn't get into a study that, that they don't really need, that they're not missing other therapies. Now, one of the biggest problems with studies is previous treatment. So some studies require that patients have no prior therapy. So if you've already gotten treatment, you're not going to be a candidate for a particular study. 
In contrast, some studies actually want to make sure that patients have had prior treatment, and they have to have had it, and then they have to actually demonstrate that it hasn't worked before they can go into the study. Now, this may seem very strange to you, but there are some, some good reasons for this. Sometimes we feel that, that a, a particular new drug might be very effective when it's given early on. If we're going to prove that, we have to give it early on. And so if patients have other therapy, it might not be that effective, and we don't want to you know, um, put a patient in that situation and give them a drug that may not be effective for them. Likewise, some drugs are really designed to actually work after um, they've already had other therapies if it doesn't work, and then we have to make sure that that is, that is the group of patients that are going on to a particular study. Likewise, with immunology, sometimes if you have chemotherapy, that can actually cause some problems in the immune system. So sometimes we look at um, the status of, of the immune system ahead of time, and we don't want that to be too beaten up or, or the drug may not be able to, to work well. We also look at the general medical issues that a patient has, like I said, patients who have bad heart disease or bad lung disease may not be good candidates if there's a drug that has side effects that would affect the lung or the heart. You'll often hear the term blood work, so we actually look at, at, at blood levels, and in general, this is a way to make sure that there's not already any problems in a, in a given patient that might actually cause the drug to cause more harm than we would expect. So sometimes th these um, tests need to be done to determine if, if, if it's safe to go into a study. And sometimes we do urine tests and EKGs looking for similar uh, potential problems. The other thing we look at is what we call performance status or life expectancy, how well are patients doing. Um, I think that when you're dealing with advanced cancer, uh, the last thing we want to do is if patients are in really bad shape or really uncomfortable, we don't want to put them through a real hardship if, if a certain treatment is expected to cause a lot of problems. Then the, maybe the better thing is to try to come up with comfort measures or come up with alternative um, kind of approaches. We also want to make sure that patients can comply with, with all the requirements of a study. Sometimes we're looking to see the levels of a drug in the blood, and that requires collecting blood samples, sometimes quite frequently for a day or two or, or seven. And, you know, that's inconvenient. And maybe somebody doesn't really want to spend time doing that. Other times people are willing to do it if they know about it. And finally, today, you, you have to get what's called an informed consent document. So this is a written document. That describes everything in the study. It describes why it's being done, how many patients are going to be treated, what the potential side effects are. It talks about what the alternatives are, what if you don't do it. Um, and you should get that if you go on a clinical trial. If you don't get that, then you should question where you're at because we all spend a lot of our, our time when we're not seeing patients writing these informed consents and they get reviewed by a number of review bodies. And it's very important that you read those. Uh, you would be asked to sign those, and you should get a copy of that uh, you know, for your records and to keep with you. It's also important to remember that if you go on a clinical trial, you're always free to change your mind at any point, and you just have to let the doctor treating you know that, I changed my mind, I don't want to continue with this, and that, that's always your right, and that should be written in the consent form. So likewise, there are a number of things that might exclude a patient from a study. So in melanoma, some of the common things are the presence of brain disease. So if there's tumor in the brain or spine, sometimes these patients are not allowed to go on studies. The reason for this is some of the drugs don't get into the brain. So we wouldn't want a patient who had a brain uh, uh, melanoma to spend time getting a drug that is absolutely not going to work. And disease in the brain can actually grow very quickly, so there are other options for them. Some studies, however, are specifically designed to look at brain disease, and in fact, uh, we're getting excited about some of the new agents in melanoma because we think they do get into the brain area, and so there are increasing studies that are either allowing it or allowing if the brain is stable for a period of time, you can go on the study, or there are specific studies just for patients with brain disease. Typically, patients have to be recovered from any prior therapies that they got. Um, sometimes there's abnormal blood tests. Sometimes, um, for example, uh, it's not unusual to ask patients to get a hepatitis or an HIV test. And if those are positive, a, a lot of times these patients are, can't go on a study. It's not to punish a patient, but there's concern then that um, some of the drugs might be more dangerous in that setting and it may not be safe to, to proceed. 
And then, again, uh, we look at other medical problems and medication. So um, sometimes uh, if patients are on certain medicines, that may actually prevent them from going on to a study. And again, this is really a protection mechanism. So for example, with some of the immunotherapies, we don't like patients to be on corticosteroids because we think that can maybe undo the action of the, of the drugs that we're, we're treating with. Likewise, for some of the drugs that may be direct injections into tumors, patients who are on blood thinners may not be eligible because it might lead to more uh, chance of bleeding. And finally, um, in general, we don't like patients going on clinical studies to be pregnant. Um, not always an issue, but it's important to remember that, that you have to use birth control when you're on a study. And the reason for this is, again, most drugs, although we, we don't know what goes on in children, we for sure don't know what goes on in the fetus, and it could be very dangerous. So again, this isn't really meant to punish anybody, but to really protect until we have more information about it. So you'll, you'll hear that a lot if you choose to do a study. So the questions that you should be asking if, if you're thinking about doing a study is you should really understand what, what, why the study is being done, what, what's the point of it. Um, the questions that are good to ask is have other patients had this treatment before? Um, what was the outcome in those patients? What were the side effects if, if they're known? Is this in fact a randomized study? Is there a placebo group? Um, what are the chances that I would get that if, if I agreed to do this? You might also want to ask how much additional blood tests and other, other kinds of things are necessary. Sometimes we like to get additional CAT scans. So we might do many more CAT scans, for example, in following somebody closely on a study than we would normally get, and that would increase the risk of exposure to radiation. Um, I don't think these risks are particularly bad, but it is something to, to know and understand. Other studies will follow a kind of uh, routine pattern uh, of getting these uh, scans done. And then again, I would... Um, uh, really ask that if there are side effects, do you know what to do with them? So sometimes when you have a brand new drug, we don't always know what the side effects are, um, but as drugs are developing, uh, we get pretty smart about how to manage the side effects, and sometimes um, they're mild nuisances, but we have to deal with them and we have to know about them ahead of time, and sometimes there could be new things, uh, and that's a particular issue with clinical trials. Um, Ask about the treatment and the schedule. Um, many of the new drugs we have are actually oral, so I think it's important to remember to ask, is this an IV? Um, should I have like a, a port put in, you know, to make it easier to get an IV? Or is this something that can go in my, my arm uh, every time I come in? What is the dose that I'm going to be getting? Um, how often do I have to come in? Um, important to ask if whether the treatment will prevent you from getting another drug. So again, something that, that I know Dr. Maynard and I spend a lot of time talking about is if we have, you know, four studies um, and we have a patient in front of us, which study should they go into first or second or third and why? And sometimes they can't go into one until they do another one. And sometimes if they do one, they won't be able to get into the other one. So again, you should ask about all the studies available. And I, you know, we work pretty closely together and... Um, in addition to Dr. Carvajal, I have a good friend of mine, Dr. Wolchuks at Sloan Kettering, and we often talk about we may have a study that they don't have at Sloan Kettering, and Sloan Kettering may have a study we don't have here, and we're usually pretty happy to send a patient um, if we think that other study is, is, is a better one for them to get into at this particular time. Um, always important to ask what the other options are because um, your doctor may say to you, hey, I think this is a really good thing for you, and you may say that's great, but what else is there? Just ask them, well, if I, did, if I said no to this, then what would the other options be? Also ask where the treatment is given. Some treatments are given in the office. Some, are, some you have to actually go in the hospital. Um, and then typically who you call with questions or problems. And again, if you go on a study, you often will meet um, a whole set of new people, research nurses and, and coordinators and all kinds of uh, other people that, that are there to help you. But you should be very clear when you walk out the door exactly who you're going to call if, if you don't feel well or something happens. Um, so is a clinical trial right um, for you? It really depends on, on you know, what your thoughts are about being in clinical research, um, how aggressive you want to be in treating your, your disease. It depends a lot on features of the disease that we just don't have any control of. 
some studies you have to have a mutation in, say, BRAF, and if your tumor doesn't have it, then that's not going to be a good study for you. And then a lot of it depends on other evaluations, as we've talked about, the blood work and general conditions. I think there are many benefits to doing clinical studies. I think, again, as I mentioned, you can get to these new drugs earlier. Um, I think you get monitored very carefully, generally, by a very experienced team. We all go through, you think medical school is hard. You should see all the training we have to do to, to actually, you know, uh, uh, you know, participate in clinical studies. So every year we have to undergo all kinds of new training and keep up with everything. So you're getting, um, with the clinical trial, I think, a particularly experienced, uh, you know, team to follow you. Re always remember that you're helping others, even if you're not helping yourself, and, and that could be a good reason to, to do it. And in some cases, there's the potential to improve the quality of life, I think, by participating in a clinical trial, whether it's psychologically feeling better that you're doing what you can do or whether there's actually going to be a real physical benefit. Um, there are also some disadvantages of going on to clinical trials. In general, we don't often know what the ex real rate of response is, so um, we can't guarantee it, and there may actually turn out to be no benefit. And the truth is that most clinical trials are, in fact, negative and are not successful. Um, but, um, you know, again, every drug that does get approved at some point did have a successful clinical trial. You can get into unexpected side effects. So even if we have a good idea of what they are, we may uncover new ones. Um, and then finally, as much as a clinical trial might improve the quality of life, it could also make it worse. And again, you have to always weigh that into your general situation and, and how you're feeling and all of those uh, other things. If you do want to go on to a clinical trial, how do, how do you even begin this process? Because again, not clinical trials aren't everywhere, and every clinical trial isn't in, in one single place. So a good place to start is with your own personal physician. Uh, sometimes they'll have knowledge of it. Uh, sometimes they don't. If you're, if you're coming you know, to see a melanoma expert, we probably have a good idea of what's going on, but if you're out in the community with a doctor who only sees a, a few melanoma patients every year, they may not be totally familiar with melanoma studies. If they mainly see breast cancer, they may be more familiar with those. But most, most physicians will probably be, be honest with you and say, I, I don't really know, or they'll say, yes, I do know, or I know who to call and, and who to talk to. Um, the National Cancer Institute is a fantastic resource. We're actually required to put all of our studies there, so every clinical trial um, I think quality clinical trials should be listed, and there's a, a phone number that you can call or the clinicaltrials.gov website keeps a relatively up-to-date listing of studies. You can actually go in and search by melanoma. You can put in what kinds of treatments you're interested in. It's a good place to go to. And then finally, um, uh, typically uh, NCI designated cancer centers are really mandated to do clinical trials, and so, for example, at Rutgers, here we, we actually maintain, uh, we have about 215 clinical trials right now uh, for cancer, and this is our, our website, and again, you can get a listing of those, and I'm sure if you go to Sloan Kettering, they have a listing of their studies, and most of the major cancer centers, you can find this on the website. Um, a little bit about what we have here, so uh, again, this is our clinical team of physicians, um, and I just, I ran out of space. Uh, for all the other people, but we work with a number of research nurses and coordinators and nurse practitioners and uh, phlebotomists and tissue collection experts and all kinds of other people. And so when you join a study, you actually get access to this big team of people uh, who are all very dedicated to um, providing, you know, what I think is very high quality clinical care. I want to mention just a few of the studies that we have. I, I'm going to end shortly, but um, one of the studies that we just started is an early um, uh, phase one, phase two study of a new drug called Selectokine. And I think Dr. Goidos mentioned interleukin-2 as a treatment that's been around since 1998. Uh, we offer interleukin-2 here. Um, and I think it's a reasonable drug for some patients, but it requires being in the hospital. Um, it has quite a few side effects. And in order to kind of decrease the side effects but maintain the potential benefit of uh, interleukin-2, we're using a molecule called selectokine. This is an antibody. And what the antibody does is it actually binds to areas of dying tumor cells. And in order to induce uh, tumor cell death, we actually use radiation. So we radiate a tumor, 
and then this is an intravenous injection, and the antibody will go to the tumor site, and it has two IL-2 molecules with it. So this is a way to bring the IL-2 just to where the tumor is growing and avoid it from going everywhere else in the body where it will cause side effects. And so um, this is um, open, and we've started enrolling some patients in, in the study already. You probably heard the exciting news that just last week the FDA approved um, a drug called PD-1 uh, for the treatment of melanoma. We're all very excited about that, and Dr. Maynard was actually uh, part of that study, and Sloan Kettering uh, was a major player in, in the development of this particular pathway. It's, I don't want to get too complicated, but I'll teach you a little immunology. Um, we know that, that tumor cells, which are shown here, have a molecule on the surface called PD-L1. It's the ligand for PD-1. And why do tumor cells have this on their cell surface? Um, the reason they have it is that it binds to a molecule called PD-1 or programmed death one on T cells. And T cells are really good cells because they kill the cancer. And when the PD-L1 on the tumor binds to that PD-1, the PD-1 actually kills the, the T cell. It turns it off. So the PD-L1 is a way that protects the tumor from the immune system. And so what the PD-1 antibody does is it really tries to prevent that interaction so that the T cell can't be shut off. And so we are actually studying here not PD-1, but an antibody to PD-L1. And so it, in theory, should do similar work. And it's, again, it's an IV medication. And we are now studying that in a number of different cancers, but we have a study here um, uh, actually at Rutgers where we're studying the PDL one in patients who've already failed um, other previous uh, therapy. Um, one of the things that I know Dr. Goidos mentioned to you is my interest in oncolytic viruses. And so these are actually normal viruses. Um, we've worked with a number of different ones over the years, um, including vaccinia virus, which is the, the smallpox vaccine. We've most, more recently worked with a herpes virus that causes the common cold sore. And then there's a Coxsackie virus, which also causes the common cold. And interestingly, many of these viruses, if you inject them into a cancer, it tends to actually kill the tumor cells. And um, by taking out some of the, the disease-causing genes in the virus, it actually doesn't cause any side effects in normal cells. And so what happens is if you inject this, it starts to kill these, um, the tumor cells directly, which is great, but more importantly, we think, is it actually stimulates an immune response. So as the, as the melanoma cells are dying, it actually starts to teach the immune system, the T cells, um, what the bad melanoma proteins look like, and then in theory, those T cells can go throughout the body and, and kill the um, cells, and uh, the, the melanoma cells wherever they might be. And so we've recently completed a phase three study, which did suggest that there was an improvement in response rates in patients who got this treatment. And we saw really some very minor side effects, uh, which were mostly some fever and chills and some pain at the site where this was being injected. So we are now extending those studies in, in two clinical trials here. One is this trial where everybody gets the oncolytic virus. Um, and we're looking at a number of what we call biomarkers to see how it's impacting the immune system, to see if the virus is present in the blood or the urine. Um, and the other study we're doing is combining this with um, uh, two of the other already approved drugs in melanoma, the Yervoy and the recent um, Keytruda, the, the PD-1. And so those studies are, are um, available here. And finally, um, you know, one of the areas that we're very interested in is, is combining some of these agents together. And so two of the approved drugs that we already have for melanoma are interleukin-2 and the IPI, ipilimumab or Yervoy. And so we thought, what if you just tried both of these drugs together? So we actually did that in, in the, our animals first. So this is um, a graph of what happens in mice if you treat them with nothing um, by 17 days after giving them melanoma, they all die. If you give them IL-2, about 20% of the mice seem to be able to survive and seem to be uh, okay. And if you give them the uh, uh, anti-CTLA-4 is like the ipilimumab, about 40% of the mice seem to survive. But if you give them both, then 80% of the mice seem to be okay and survive. So based on this pretty exciting result, we're now testing these combination in, in, in patients. 
And in fact, there's been an early study that was done and uh, suggested actually that about 30% of patients had a response to that. And interestingly, in that study, 17% had a complete response, meaning all, all the melanoma went away. So just to conclude, um, I hope what I, what I got across to you is that we've made great progress in melanoma. I think the next two talks you're going to hear are going to continue to prove that to you. Clinical trials could be a good option for some patients if you have to deal with this disease. It's really important that you discuss this uh, both with your, your own doctor um, and with your family uh, and friends. And remember that a clinical trial is never a guarantee of anything. Um, and also, clinical trials are always changing. So, um, you know, if you ever go to a restaurant and they always have the same menu, but you know how some restaurants change their menu all the time? Well, cl clinical trials are always changing. The standard of care is always the same. So we have a set of approved drugs. They should always be available to you. But the clinical trial menu will always be different. So even if they didn't have something for you last month, this month we might have something for you. So anyway, thank you for your attention.